cult leaders are almost always narcissists and what we call malignant narcissists, which means they're, they probably border on being psychopaths. There's nowhere for them to go. So there's suicides and they die in the streets and they get into drugs and they sell their bodies and they don't know how to cope. And it's horrific. The more highly educated people sometimes are the most gullible because they, they think they know better. So they don't really question. They don't really get their hackles up, right? And then that's when the whole thing burst open. Like a bunch of us just looked at each other and said, we're in a cult. Dr. Yanya Lalch is one of the top international experts in cults. She's a professor emerita of sociology at CSU Chico and the author of several books on the subject. She has spent her career researching cults and helping people recover from them. What makes her particularly unique among other cult authorities is that she spent over a decade in the cult herself and was able to successfully escape it. So when she speaks, everyone listens. So without further ado, actually, don't forget to subscribe. And now, Dr. Yanya Lalich. Let's start with the definition of the cult. If we want to look at it scientifically, it's pro- it's probably falls into anthropology. So cults started way back when. There have always been cults. And really, how I see it now, or, or what I think is a kind of typical definition, it's a t- usually a group of people. It can also be a family. Um, it can also be just two people. But typically, it's a group of people um who worship an exalted leader who is almost always authoritarian um and that leader is the one who came up with the ideology or the belief system of that group and that belief system is all encompassing in the sense that it offers you the answer to the past the present and the future it's like everything Um, and part of that belief system is that is an end justifies the means philosophy, which means that you can be asked to do anything because it's for the so-called greater good or the end goal of the organization. And then within that, there is a structure of both um, social psychological influences as well as overt rules and regulations to control and manipulate the members and get them to basically comply and conform to become good followers. And in almost every case, there is some type of exploitation, which may be sexual, physical, financial, um, but there's people are definitely being taken advantage of in, in a cult. Um, so it's not a, it's actually not a very positive <laughs> uh, label, <laughs> you know, kind of like gangs, you know, we call gangs gangs. And so uh, we call cults cults because they, they, most of the time they harm people in some way or another. Interesting. You said the cults can have just two people and even families. Mm-hmm. So basically, when we talk about families, is if you have this patriarch of a family, it's considered to be like cult leader? No, I mean, there there could be a narcissistic uh, father or mother yeah. uh, who, who creates a really rough environment for the rest of the family. That's not necessarily a cult, mm-hmm. but a lot of the same kinds of things may be happening in that context. But you could have a couple or a family where there is the head of the family, whether it's a male or a female, who also believes that they are some kind of special being, right? Or they're Mm -hmm. following some kind of special code of behavior. Um, And so in that sense, it becomes a family cult. So the, the examples we have from the ones in California, for example, was a guy in um, uh, somewhere in the central Valley, forget which town, And he basically had sex with his own children. Uh, the 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 um, family got bigger and bigger. They all lived together. Uh, he believed he was some kind of god. And the women in particular were very abused. Um, or there was another guy in Marin County, which isn't far from where we are, uh, who had many so-called wives, you know, these women he called wives, he would send them off to work and send money back to him. And when they had children, the children lived with him and he kept two women with him to raise the children. He was a black guy and all his wives were black except one 
who was white, and he always hated the child who was mixed race. And so one day he killed that child who was four years old. And the women wouldn't testify against him because they were completely enthralled with him. They thought he, again, was some kind of special being. So that would be an example of a family cult. In this uh, case, this woman also start believing that he's special. It's not that j- they just terrified of him, right? Well, they are terrified of him, but they also believe he's special. <laughs> um, you know, the, I mean, fear is fear is very much part of being in a cultic relationship. I mean, because the cult leaders are almost always narcissists and what we call malignant narcissists, which means they're they probably border on being psychopaths. So Mm -hmm. they're very, they can be very mean and harsh and cruel. You are expected to love the leader, right? And adore him or her and worship. But also you're always walking on eggshells because you never know when the leader turns up, if it's going to be the nice, wonderful leader or the mean, horrible leader, right? So you're, you're, you're kind of living just on eggshells and in a constant state of anxiety um, while you're in the cult. And that's that's one of the after effects people are left with, like just having been in this constant anxious state um, and, and you know, being terrified all the time. That's interesting because my view of cults was, you know, this famous ones like Scientology and et cetera, et cetera. I, I've never thought about the family being cult. And you even said two people can be a cult. Like, how does that work? It's basically, again, one mm-hmm. person in the relationship claims to be special or have special powers, can read your mind, you know, can be all kinds of things. So the 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 classic example was um, this couple, uh, the, his name was Joel Steinberg and her name was Hedda Nussbaum. And this was back in New York, I think in the 80s or 90s. She had a child, as in many domestic relationships, he slowly cut her off from her family. He had her quit her job. He berated her all the time and made her feel like she was stupid. He was the big man who knew everything. Um, You know, he had special powers and they had a child. And again, in this case, the child died and she ran out in the street holding the baby and somebody called the police. He got arrested. He did go to jail um, and she was, you know, evaluated psychologically and, and recovered very well, actually, and became a spokesperson. But that was an example of a of a couple that's obviously a domestic abusive relationship, but had these cultic overtones because he brought a, a philosophy or an ideology into it. So abusive relationship where a person believes in, in uh, his or her supernatural uh, abilities is basically a cult. Could be a cult, yes. This example would, to me would sound like a typical abusive relationship, but... Yeah, I wouldn't think about it as a cult, but now that makes sense. Is there like a profile of a person who tends to be indoctrinated into cult? No. So, uh, and of course, this is a question I get all the time. Yeah. Um, You know, I've been doing this for 35 years and I myself was in a cult. So I'm not saying this just because I was in a cult. (laughs) But um, if, if there's a common denominator among people who join, it's people who are idealistic like people who mm-hmm. want a better world or a better life, or even if it's more money or a better family or a better spiritual belief system, whatever, they get drawn into something, they get introduced to something so that two thirds of people in cults <clears throat> are recruited by a family member, a friend or a co-worker, right? So it's someone you know, brings you to the first event, right? And that's all they need to do is get you to that first event. And then the cult recruiters are really good at what they do. And they do what we call love bombing, and they make you feel really special. And they invite you back. And it all feels really great and hunky dory. And they're your best friends. Mm -hmm. Um, There are personal vulnerabilities that can add to that. um, But vulnerabilities aren't like a, a sickness. We're all vulnerable a thousand times in our lives, right? You're vulnerable if it's your raining. I'll be very vulnerable if my dog dies, you know, one of these days. I'm, you know, you're vulnerable when you move to a new town, when you graduate from college, you know, all these, or you just got divorced or whatever it might be. So it's often this combination of people wanting purpose and meaning in their life, which is a very human desire, on top of being in a vulnerable space where you're kind of open to being snatched up, (laughs) I guess is Mm -hmm. how I'll say it. (laughs) So it's really all kinds of people. And of course, 
Cults will target certain people. They target rich people for sure because they want the money or they want the celebrity, uh, the legitimacy. Um, mm -hmm. They'll target A-type personalities because you have to work for them. I mean, your job is to keep the cult going, whether it's to run the businesses or keep recruiting, bring in money, bring in talent, whatever it might be. So they are going to look for that type of person. And it's often that type of person coupled with the idealism that thinks they're joining something good. I mean, nobody thinks they're joining a cult, right? I mean, yeah. you think I joined, you know, a group that I thought was fighting for equality, right? Racial equality, sexual equality, you know, get rid of poverty. It all sounded wonderful to me. In the end, you know, we spent 10 years spinning our wheels and beating each other up and criticizing each other morning, noon and night. And um, our leader would go off to Bulgaria to communist conferences you know, and, and her dream was to get to Russia. So there you have it. But it's not what we thought at the start, you know. So you mentioned these uh, cult recruiters right, and what they do. So a couple of questions there. Do these people realize they're cult recruiters? I mean, it, I suppose there can be the person who is innocently saying, you know, come to my church this Sunday. But in most cases, you know, cults will have plans and strategies and they'll train people. Like, in, again, in my cult, I was the head of recruitment. And every week people had to send in a recruitment report of all, of anyone in their life who they thought they would be able to recruit and they'd write a little paragraph. And then I would go through that and decide which ones looked like prime targets. And then I would go back to the militants and say, OK, this is the person we want to work on. Militants. So, yeah, we, we called ourselves militants. We were communists. Yeah, we were militants. We were cadre. Comrades. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, comrades. I was comrade Emma. <laughs> they even changed your name yeah you had to change your name you can, and you could only have a first name no one no one was supposed to know anyone else's name yeah that sounds cultish okay <laughs> you were head of recruitment so you probably did a lot of damage to a lot of people i did yeah, and i felt terrible when i got out take me back to the actual beginning of like how did you end up on that call like how, who targeted you who brought you in why did you believe in this idea? Here's how it happened. I had I had a, already I grew up in an immigrant family. Um, my father was very patriarchal. He didn't think girls should go to college, and he said I was a nice um, I was a nice Serbian girl, and I had big hips, and I was going to have nice Serbian boy babies, and I was going to marry a nice Serbian boy. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. So I got myself to college. I graduated with honors. I did my junior year in France. I then applied for a Fulbright. I got it. I spent another year in France doing research. I then moved to New York because I didn't want to go back to Milwaukee. And I had a job at a bank where I could speak French. And then I got tired of doing that. And I dropped out and I became a hippie. <laughs> and I really did the hippie thing. I did it up good. <laughs> Long story short, I ended up living on a Spanish island uh, in the Mediterranean, in the Balearics, for about four and a half years. And then I decided it was time to come back to the States and just see what was happening. So I came back and a fr my friend from, from my junior year from college, who had been my roommate in New York, was now living in San Francisco. And she said, oh, come move to San Francisco one of our roommates is moving out and you can have a room in our house. And she was with a bunch of women who had just gone to law school. They were like the first wave of women who went to law school in the 70s. So I got myself to San Francisco. I had hair down to my butt. I had island dresses <laughs> and I came out as a lesbian. So I cut off the hair. I stopped, you know, bought blue jeans and combat boots. And <laughs> anyway, so it was a you know, a transitional time for me. I'm, I'm sort of showing what the vulnerabilities were, right? I'm new in town. I'm coming out as a lesbian. And even though we lived in the Castro district, it was very scary. I was 30 years old. I was terrified people were going to like beat me up on the street or, you know, um, so that was like that. My Fulbright year in France was in 1968 when May 68, when France went on strike, the whole country went on strike. And so did the universities. And so that was a very political moment for me. It really helped politicize me. So anyway, I'm in San Francisco. I'm a new kid on the block. And I keep running into this woman who's a friend of my roommate. 
and we have these great political discussions. And so this is like 1975. The Vietnam War had just ended and people on the left were kind of looking for like, what do we do now? What do we get involved <laughs> in now? Right. So she approached me one day and said, hey, we have a study group. Do you want to join our study group? It's just for women. And so I thought, oh, well, meet new people. That sounds great. And study groups were very common at that time in most of the urban areas, like the leftists had these study groups. So we had this group. It was about 10 people, 10, 12 people. And we read Marx and Lenin and Le Duan, you know, Vietnamese, whoever, the revolutionary leaders. I didn't realize that half the people there were already in this background organization, that this study group was actually a front group for recruiting into the background organization. So after a few weeks, this woman met with me again and said, oh, what are you learning in the study group? And I said, well, I'm learning that um, in order to really make any kind of real social change, you have to have a Marxist-Leninist democratic centralist organization, which probably sounds familiar to you as a Russian. <laughs> yeah, I grew up there. <laughs> and she said, yes, and what if we told you we have one? And I'm like, what? So she says, yeah, we have this organization, it's international, it's diverse, it's blah, blah, blah. Wouldn't you like to join? And I'm so I'm like, yeah, sure, I'd love to join. You know, I'm not thinking a lot about it. So she said, okay, here, here's this application. You have to fill out this application. So it's this kind of bait and switch, like, right? It makes you want it more. So the application, of course, asked everything about your life, your bank account, your family, your passport number. So by the, So now they have everything on you, right? Um, and then a week or so later, I was told I was accepted and it started from there. And, and I, I had no clue what I was joining. I didn't even know there was a leader. And so you thought it's what, like study group or, or some... I just thought it was going to be some kind of political activist group, you know, okay. that would do demonstrations or, you know, fight and fight alongside the unions when they went on strike and stuff like that. But it ended up being uh, the leader was actually a woman who was... Um, a megalomaniac. She was very psychologically troubled. She was an alcoholic. Most of the members never met her. Uh, those of us in the inner circle had to spend a lot of time with her, which was very brutal. So we spent our days, people were given different assignments, um, like work in our print shop or work in our publishing house or work at our doctor's office or go get a job in such and such a factory and try to recruit workers, whatever, right? And I was always internal. I always w w was on staff and was in the inner circle. And so we would get up six in the morning, get home at one at night. Then you'd have to write reports like self-criticisms and security reports. And most of the time we sat around in circles and criticized each other for something or other. People were put on trial, just like the trials in Russia. Oh, my. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. And it was it was brutal. And in the beginning, I really thought this was a really serious organization, that this was what you had to do to be a steeled cadre, to fight for the revolution. We didn't believe the revolution would happen in our lifetime. We felt that we were martyrs who were planting the seeds and it was going to be difficult. So no complaining because Chairman Mao always said the revolution isn't a tea party. So we had all the slogans kept us going and it was a horrible life. And you probably did it for almost free. Absolutely for free. And and that's true of most cults. The cults are masters at labor trafficking, basically. I mean, I worked 10 years for, well, I shouldn't say for free. What we did was we had a finance committee who figured out how much money we had to have to survive, to function. And everybody except the leader lived on a certain amount, which was below poverty level. Let's say it was $500 a month. So if you worked a job, you gave to the organization, everything you made over $500 a month. And those of us who were full time were given $500 a month, which never was enough to live on. So we all lived like, you know, we'd cram eight people into an old Victorian in San Francisco and we'd turn the living rooms into bedrooms and the dining rooms into bedrooms. And, you know, and we ate crap food. And I mean, we never had time to eat anyway. Um, and you'd never had a penny for anything. So, yeah, when I got out, I was 41 when I got out and I had nothing. I had nothing. Oh, you had experience that you, that brought you. Yes, I had today, experience. Right? And, and in fact, I was lucky because our, our crazy cult leader ordered me to uh, build us a publishing house. 
which I did. And um, I so I learned publishing. And that's why when the cult, when I got out, I went to New York because I figured I could get a job in publishing. Um, Interesting. So I at least learned a skill, which many people didn't. So let's talk about your leader, because in the beginning of the interview, you said that typically the cult leader is somebody with uh, some extraordinary abilities, right? And you also mentioned that everything is uh, built around that person. Whereas here we have uh, somebody who most members don't even know, right? How did that work? No, well, they know they knew of her. I mean, all we oh, did was okay. talk about her. She was our supreme leader, but oh, they never, gotcha. many of them never saw her in person because most she had a. We were headquartered in San Francisco, and we had different buildings around San Francisco, but she she and she lived in somebody's upstairs, you know, top of a house, but she also had a house in Bodega Bay. And she spent ended up as years went on, spent most of her time in Bodega Bay drunk and having <laughs> people remodel her house over and over and over again. Um, I mean, it got really absurd, which is part of what led to the end, because it 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 got too absurd. It no longer had anything to do with the American working class, which is what we thought we were fighting for. All it became about was getting her to Russia, like her dream of getting her to Russia. And so. It, people were getting really disaffected, especially those of us at the top, because we knew what the hell was going on and saw her, you know, drunk and raging and waving guns around. And, you know, in the end, we had our revolution and we overthrew our leader and we voted to dissolve the organization and to expel her. How did that work, though? Like, how did you start that internal revolution? Because it was 10 years, um, we had what we called stations around the country in L.A., in New York, in Tennessee. We had the cadre members, the top level cadre members, the inner circle types, who I would say most of us were there pretty much from the beginning. So we had been through it all. And then we had various levels of membership who witnessed or didn't witness certain abuses. Um, everybody was in involved if there was a trial or an expulsion or something like that. The thing that actually happened that that was her downfall was that she broke with her second in command. And her second in command was really, in a way, the heartbeat of the organization. That's who recruited me. Mm -hmm. Her second in command knew everybody, met everybody, knew everybody by name, knew everything about you, she was very charismatic, but also just in a second could just be lash out viciously. And she knew everybody's buttons to push. And she was also just, you know, so dedicated, so devoted. So like, I wanted to be like her, you know, she was my role model. I modeled myself after her um, and became a queen bitch, basically. <laughs> um, but whereas Marlene, our comrade Kim, was her name she named herself after the korean guy um comrade kim was off never around having to be taken care of you know drunk spouting nonsense raging around something whereas rosa was on the scene with everybody so at one point i don't know exactly what caused the split but at one point comrade kim the leader banished Rosa to her house and said she could not leave her house and no one could visit her or no one could talk to her. But what actually started happening was that we did go visit her <laughs> and and we all started mumbling amongst ourselves, there's something not right here, there's something not right here. And because Comrade Kim was off in Bodega Bay, which was miles away, um, you know, you knew she wasn't going to pop in the room while you were sort of whispering with each other. So so various People in couples, not not couple couples, but a couple of people here, a couple of people there, a few leaders there started rumbling and mumbling. And then she left the com comrade Kim left the country to go to Bulgaria because that was her dreamland. So she was off in Bulgaria. And then that's when the whole thing burst open, like a bunch of us just looked at each other and said, we're in a cult. And we called everybody together and we told them what was going on. And it was safe to do because she was out of the country. She was just one person, but she had so much power over everyone. Yeah. You had and to it, was, you know, it was in crazy. part I, when we got recruited, like she was she was older than the rest of us. Mm -hmm. She had a Ph.D. She had been a, oddly enough, she had been a sociology professor. Uh, so we thought she was super smart. 
she had a bit of a reputation in the women's movement and she just portrayed herself as this brilliant the second coming of lenin you know um like she used to she used to call lenin lenin because her name was marlene and i think she did oh. that rhymed with marlene <laughs> right? interesting okay yeah. yeah so that's that's uh in the beginning it started with like 12 people from a study group she was invited to the study group and she kind of took it over and she declared herself the leader right from the start and that's how it went i'm kind of trying to follow the definition so the cult leader doesn't have to have a supernatural uh, natural abilities but can be somebody the smartest one in the room basically the smartest one in the room like keith ranieri if you know about the nexium cult I mean, I've he, read about it a little bit, and I I know that he's in jail now. Can you tell a little bit more about yeah, the cult? Yeah, yeah, two hundred two hundred plus years. But you know, he actually said he was the smartest man in the world. You know, when he barely graduated from college, and so, but people believed him, and nobody bothered to check it out. And and that's part of the problem that goes on with cults is like people don't do enough research before they jump into something, right? And that's why I always say, slow down. You don't have to join today. If they tell you the guru is only going to be here this weekend, that's not true. The guru is going to be back another time. Like, take your time, do your research. There's so much information on the internet now um, where you can see, you know, other people who belonged and what they have to say about it. Or, I mean, the problem is people don't do their research. If they if they treated joining something like they do buying a car, they'd be much better off because nobody buys the first car they look at, right? Yeah, but when people want to buy a car, they realize that they're searching for a car. But what is here, they're not realizing that they ended up in, in a cult, right? And in fact, the no. fact the way you just describe it, it's there are way more cults than, than I actually imagined. Like everything is cult. No, kind. no, like I get this all the time. Are the Marines a cult? No, the Marines aren't a cult. The Marines use a lot of the same influence and control tactics they are they do break you down they rebuild you up but while you're in the marines you're getting a paid you're getting a pension they don't tell you who to marry you sign a contract that has a limit on it you don't have to re-up even though there's probably going to be a lot of pressure to re-up if you don't re-up and you leave you're not you know shunned and never talked to again whereas in a cultic organization if you get kicked out or you leave like you've lost everything you've lost all your friends that's why it's so hard for people to leave they, they have to leave their whole family behind so these organizations that that come across as very strict like like some of the military like the catholic church even the catholic church the catholic church i mean yes it's probably the closest <laughs> um and there have certainly have been abuses and it took forever to get those abuses recognized and and dealt with but even there they have guidelines to live by right they say don't use birth control mm -hmm. but they're not coming into your bedroom to see if you're using birth control whereas that's what a cult does right mm. the invasion into your life is 100 what are some craziest cults you've <laughs> encountered over your career Well, what do you, I mean, what do you mean by crazy? I phrase the question that way and you tell me what you mean by crazy and what was crazy <laughs> to you. Well, I don't like to use that word because I don't want to, I don't want to sound, want to sound like I'm making fun of the people who belong to that group. Yeah. Okay. Right. But, you know, there are, there are groups with very odd beliefs. You know, there's the, the breatharians who believe you only need to b live on air can you well, elaborate on that well they're called breatharians and they just tell you only to breathe and then i, I think you probably eventually die <laughs> yeah i'm like they, they don't yeah. eat they don't they don't no um, well you're cult member for like three days and then you yeah. die <laughs> and then there's um you know ones like the these people who say they channel ascended beings So there was like Ramtha, the woman up in Washington, who said she channeled this like 50,000 year old being and she would like talk in a really low voice when she was channeling him and she would give you financial advice and people paid thousands to listen to her. And, you know, and, I, you know, I guess one person's crazy is another person's spiritual belief. I mean, yeah. who's to say? I mean, I, I, it's not about judging the belief system. I mean, what. What I look for are the behaviors of the group. 
like the structure and the behaviors and how are the members being treated? I don't care what they believe in. What are the biggest cults, biggest known cults? Well, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, to some degree, Scientology. On, on, on some level, you can't really believe statistics that the group gives you because they're always going to inflate. Um, I know we did, you know, like we had newspapers and we'd say, oh, we sold, you know, 10,000 newspapers when we probably sold a thousand, you know, the Unification Church, uh, which was called the Moonies, um, they were very big for a time. And now since he died, there's kind of these three offshoots. It depends on the on the on the decade, you know, Children of God, which was really big in the 70s and 80s, 60s, 70s, 80s, um, was very big, was all over the world. I'd have to tell you, like I said, I've been doing this for 35 years and every day I hear of new ones like that I haven't heard of. It's interesting, but of all you mentioned, the Mormon church almost not considered to be cult. It's almost like mainstream. Because fact, it's, because they're so wealthy. Okay, yeah, maybe that's the thing. But Scientology is not not uh, poor neither. No, but Mormons are in very influential positions in local and federal governments. And I think for Mormons, I mean, I think some of the beliefs are quite extreme that people don't know about. Mm -hmm. And I think it really matters a lot on your family and how much your family is enforcing you know, the actual things you're supposed to do. Um, but like, you know, when the when the boys go off on those missions for two years, they get sent somewhere in the world and they have to fend for themselves. I mean, that's really their their real indoctrination period. Have you seen the Book of Mormon? I've, I've heard about it. But <laughs> interesting, like I've met first Americans. Those are Mormons in my little town in, in Russia. Only later I realized that they're Mormons. Actually, when I came here, like, oh, that's what who the guys were. Very nice guys. They were. Uh, yeah. But. When I think about cults, obviously they're tragic for people who join them. But I think the more tragic is for kids who got born into them. Oh, absolutely. Like, how do they cope with it? How do they, can they even leave a cult? No, it's horrible. This is, and this is the big population that, that we're serving right now in my, uh, my nonprofit. For the past decade or so, the people who were born or raised you know, from a young age in a cult and they get out, many of them get out. They don't even know their real name. They don't know if they have a birth certificate. They don't know if they have any relatives on the outside. They don't know where to go. They don't know anything about our educational system. Like if they could get a GED or to drive a car or to get a computer, the more like isolated the group was, um, and the more enclosed, the, the harder it is for those ones who leave, no matter what their age. My latest book, um, I interviewed 68 or 69 people who grew up in cults and from 39 different cults. And the stories just broke my heart. I mean, I, I, I would finish an interview and I would just like flop on my bed and cry. I mean, it, it was heartbreaking. And the sexual and physical abuse of children is rampant. It's horrific. It's all under the radar because most of these cults homeschool, which is why I'm very against homeschooling, because it's really not regulated. And anybody can say they're doing homeschooling. And really in the cults, all they do is teach the leaders nonsense, right? They don't, you know, they come out, sometimes they don't know how to read or write. I mean, it's just horrific. It's horrific. And I just had a meeting about this today. It's really like an unrecognized public health problem as far as I'm concerned. And we have no resources, no resources. They can go to a domestic violence shelter and they'll get turned away because they don't, they don't fit the criteria. There's nowhere for them to go. So there's suicides and they die in the streets and they get into drugs and they sell their bodies and they don't know how to cope. And it's horrific. How did you find the 69 people? Well, I, I you know, I'm fairly well known. Um, uh -huh. I mean, it was actually the last project I did while I was teaching, um, you know, as a professor at one of the, at California State Chico. I just put the word out there. There are various websites like there is a website of kids of Scientology. There's a website of kids from the Children of God. A lot of these people have started their own websites. So I would just post wherever I could. I'm looking for research subjects for this, this, and this. And if you, you know, know anybody else, or if you're interested, contact me. And then I would interview everybody and make sure they fit the criteria. And, um, you know, it went through the 
university ethics board and all of that. So it wasn't hard finding people, really. People you spoke to, obviously, they realized they were in cult. Are they, were they trying to get, get out of it or not necessarily? They were all out of it. The ones I interviewed were all out. Yeah. And Got they it. left at different ages. Some left at 16 and just ran away or whatever, uh, or went to some. They did know they had some relatives somewhere, so they went to grandma or aunt to whoever. Some were 40 when they left um, and still had huge issues of of trying to adjust to regular society because, mo you know, the like I said, the more isolated or sequestered the group, the more, you know, I mean, every one of them, every single one of them said, when I got out, I felt like I landed from Mars. Like I felt like I was from Mars. Like I felt like an alien. I felt like people were staring at me. I didn't know what to do. Um, I felt a little bit of that when I left my cult after 10 years, but I had had a life before that, right? I was 30 when I joined. So I had friends, I had family I could go back to. These people leave their usually cut off from their whole family. They don't know if they'll ever see their family again. It, it's it's tragic. Um, and they they because they're in the confines of of a, of whatever group, um, they don't go through the normal developmental processes that a child goes through. Mm -hmm. So if you study social psychology at all or psychology, there's a guy named Eric Erickson and he outlined these eight developmental stages um, that people should go through. And each stage is like years one to three. And then you should, as a baby, certain things should happen to you that and you accomplish that you sort of graduate to the next stage of development. Well, when you're in a cult, you're not going through those normal stages because everything is imposed on you. You're not finding your own way. And certainly when you hit the adolescent and teen years, which is when normally we're figuring out our own identity, right? What do we like? What do we don't like? Are we going to smoke a cigarette around the corner? Are we going to hang out with the rough guys or the pretty girls, right? That's like you're feeling out who you are, who you want to hang out with. They don't get to do that. So they come out of the cult, they could be 25 years old, and they're really functioning like a 10 year old, because they never got through the normal developmental processes. It's really one of my biggest issues right now. How do these people you interviewed realize they were in the cult? And how did they escape? Well, some ran off in the night, sometimes they went with a spouse, most of the time they left on their own. And most of the time, they just ran, you know, wherever they were, they just left or, you know, occasionally they left with, with the parents, but very, very rare. Many I'm of them have never reconciled with their parents, never seen them again. I'm guessing they escaped the abuse, not necessarily they, because they don't understand, they probably don't understand the idea of cult while being in the cult, right? No, because no. they have no, nothing no. to compare it with. Right. Although it depends on what how how well known you are and what publicity there might have been, like like with Children of God or with the Fundamental Latter Day Saints, um, you know some of those groups that were raided by the authorities because there were um, you know reports of child abuse or whatever. In those cases, like sometimes the children were taken out and people tried to talk to them, but in most cases they ended up having to get sent back. But kids seem to have. I mean, this was something I really tried to research when I was doing this, writing this book, because I think all of us have some level of resilience, just a native resilience that we're born with. And then how how that develops, I think, is just a personal thing, how that happens. And so I think some children are more resilient than others. And Often while they're in the group, they, they realize something's not right. I mean, if you're being beaten every day or you're seeing other people being beaten and sexually abused, I think it doesn't take much even for a child to think this is something this doesn't seem right, even though you don't know anything else. And often the kids are separated from their parents and sometimes the kids all live together. So then they get to kind of talk with each other. Right. Mm -hmm. And sort of what do you, you know, are you, you know, can, can we think we can get out of here? You know, <laughs> so it's a wonder any of them get out, but they do and they succeed. I mean, mo most of the people on on my team of with my nonprofit were were people who were born and raised in a cult and they're brilliant. They have college degrees now. 
So they do thrive. They do su survive and thrive depending on the help they get. And But they still have that trauma, I'm sure, that's kind of going to oh, harm them for trauma. life. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. I mean, she was in a very strict fundamentalist thing with her family. She was sexually abused starting at age three. <sighs> I mean, you know, you can't even imagine the abuses. I, am I ruining your dinner? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's just like it's interesting. Like when you I don't know, I have three year old kid. And when you said three year old, I'm like, I I just can't imagine like what. No, what uh, I, I agree with you. I'm I'm myself. I'm shocked. I mean, every day I hear new stories almost every day. But also I'm like and you even see it on social media. You know, this this pastor, that pastor, this place, that place, like the number of pedophiles in this world seems phenomenal it's like how, well, what is that about but yeah. yeah the abuse of the children is is horrific it's so underground because you know it, especially if they're not going to regular schools no one's seeing the bruises no one's seeing the weird behavior you know that happens when that happens to you as a kid um so it's, it's really rough what effect did social media have on uh, cults did it make uh, it easier to recruit or it make it did it make it easier to expose them i it's really been a mixed bag i mean it, obviously a lot of cults started using using it for recruiting and still do and even more since the pandemic and now we even have completely internet based cults you know which we never had before but as i was saying earlier there's there's also so much information on the internet you know like if if you're thinking of hiring a coach for your marriage or you're thinking of i don't know what you can just put in that person's name and then say plus cult or plus criticism and you'd be amazed at what comes up. And so social media has really, I think, almost benefited us more than harmed us. And then also recently, I'd say many of the documentaries that have come out are much, much better, that they aren't just sensational like Jonestown, mm -hmm. you know, taking advantage of like the most awful things that happened is though, you know, not every cult is going to end up like a Jonestown. And so lately I'd say again, like the, I'd say the last four or five years, the documentaries have gotten much more sensitive and well done and really honoring uh, the stories of people who were in those cults and who were able to leave. And, and I think that has helped. For people who realize that their loved ones are in cult. Mm -hmm. It's almost counterproductive to tell them they're, they're in cult. Yeah, you don't know. You don't do that. How do you, how do you pull them out of it? Well, you can't really pull them out of it. They have to pull themselves out. So uh, depending on the situation, you know, what I always say to families is don't be confrontational. Keep the conversations neutral. Try to do, if you're able to see the person, try to do fun things together. Or if you can, you know, if you can send emails or letters or whatever, I mean, every situation is different, but, you know, send them a box of their favorite cookies or just things, things that are happy things that'll bring up happy memories. You want to sort of tug at the heartstrings, right? And remind them that there, there really was a life before and that there are still people out there who love you because you'll be told, you know, everybody out there hates you and they're against your achieving your enlightenment or whatever it is, right? So I always tell families, like, be that safe haven. You know, leaving a cult is really, really difficult. So if you know you have a safe haven to go to where they're not going to question you, they're not going to say, see, I told you not to join that group, you know, like just yeah. let the person sleep, feed them, whatever. You know, if they know they have something like that, then they might leave sooner rather than later. You know, there are people who do interventions and I think that's a mixed bag and it also costs an enormous amount of money and it can make things worse. So, um, you know, that's a, again, really for a family to decide. One exercise I wanted to do with you and I'm just curious how you're going to do it. Let's say you decided to create a cult yourself. <laughs> Walk me through the steps you would go through. What type of superpower or whatever you're gonna assign yourself <laughs> how are you going to recruit the first person who would believe in your nonsense 
and how are you going to go about it? Well, I don't know. I guess if I if I'm a superpower, if I think I'm a superpower, I don't have the time to think about how think this through. But basically, I would want to recruit at least one, preferably two or three people who really believed in me and really believed in what I was promoting, because then they're going to do the work of recruiting the rest of the people. Most cult leaders are pretty lazy and they don't do very much. So they might appear every now and then and give a speech, but mostly they're just sitting on their laurels. So I would want to recruit some really, uh, really strong people with good personalities and um, the ability to like talk really talk heartfully with people and um, be be able to be, you know, have a good read on people. And then hopefully they'll recruit some people and then we'll go from there and we'll set up a structure and we'll have different levels of leadership and accountability. And, and um, I'll sit in a big chair and they'll bring me food and, <laughs> and uh, Bailey's oh. ice cream. And then, you know, it'll go from there. Why would people with these strong personalities follow you? Like because they're idealistic. Yeah, because they're idealistic, and and um and they they like what I'm what I stand for, right? So if I tell them I'm a child of of the star Orpheus, and I have you know been sent here to find the best and brightest people, so that we can affect real change in the universe. And that, that that's really important. And, and I have a book here that they could read that explains my whole philosophy. The book who that you would probably write, right? Something. Yeah, I would probably write a book since, I mean, I've already written six. So <laughs> I guess I'd write another one. <laughs> and you said earlier you were the recruiter for previous scout and you were kind of filtering who you should or target or who you shouldn't look. How did you decide who should you should target? You know, you look for people with the least amount of attachments. So preferably someone with no children, preferably even single people, unless the the unless it's a couple and for some reason they're very strong and they have good ties and they could maybe bring in money or bring in other people. But I want people with not many ties. I want people with with either money or skills. Uh, who, you know, who can bring that to the group, like an attorney or a doctor or, you know, somebody with a PhD. I mean, we recruited all people like that, people with PhDs, doctor, we had doctor's offices, we had a research institute, we had all this baloney. Um, and then also you want worker bees. So you want to recruit some people who are just really hard workers who believe in the cause and who will work morning, noon and night for nothing. How weren't you afraid of bringing lawyers and uh, PhDs? Because to me, it's like, oh, they're gonna read through my BS. They don't. Actually, the the more highly educated people sometimes are the most gullible because they they think they know better, so they don't really question. They don't really get their hackles up, right? And they sometimes get get taken easier than others. Oh, well, that's why they wild. think they're better. Maybe a last question. Maybe you could tell me a little bit about your nonprofit. So uh, last year I started the nonprofit. It's called the Lalich Center on Cults and Coercion. And so the website is www.lalichcenter.org. We have a temporary website right now because we have a company that's building our final big deal website. Mm -hmm. And we offer um, everything at this point is virtual. Um, so we do classes on Zoom. We do courses. We do discussion groups. We have discussion groups for survivors, you know, cult survivors or narcissistic family, whatever. Um, and then we also have an, other discussion groups that are just for people who were born or raised in the cult because they have different issues. Um, I'm hoping soon to start a discussion group for gays, people who either were gay while they were in something or thought they were or whatever, and obviously probably had some issues. And then also um, we'll be starting a group for families um, and friends, people who have someone in a cult, because many of them feel so lost and they have no one to talk to and their neighbors are tired of hearing about it. So <laughs> it's nice for people to meet each other that way. We've done writing workshops and we're going to be doing a music, kind of a music therapy workshop, um, an art 
art workshop. We try to keep our prices really low. Like the discussion groups are $25. Yeah. The courses, depending on how long they are, like if it's a five session course, it's probably going to be about $250, but we do offer scholarships. Um, and so part of the reason I started the nonprofit was so that we could get donations to help cover expenses for those who can't afford it because many, many survivors, you know, as we were saying earlier, don't have anything. So we always want to be be able to offer, you know, have our services be available no matter what someone's situation is. And then we're also going to be doing a course in the summer on um, how to be an ethical coach because coaching is now this kind of new thing where anybody and everybody's calling themselves a coach and they may have no training and they're charging lots of money. Right. And so we have two people from up in Canada, actually, who are going to lead this course on how to be an ethical coach. And then we'll also start our courses again, um, like foundations of recovery and forgiveness of self and different things like that, um, that are usually five or six week courses for survivors to where we do psychoeducation to help them sort of get the language and get a grasp on what happened to them. Well, it's a very honorable mission. Um, Dr. Lodge, thank you very much for being oh, on the podcast. Thank you. And-